Sunisha, what's your favourite species of ant? To be honest, I'm not not a big fan of insects. <laughs> That's the correct answer. Army ants, as you may have guessed from their name, are a species of impossibly abundant, ravenous insects endemic to the many forests of Earth. Armed with one of the strongest sets of jaws relative to their size, contrary to their fearsome reputation, army ants are actually real bros to the rest of the world. Alright, to start off with, why are army ants known as bros? Yeah, well, I call them bros, but scientists refer to them as a keystone species, which is the term used to describe any creature that has, and I quote, a disproportionate impact on the environment in which it lives. And as you may have surmised, Nisha, and you lovely folks at home, from the specific use of the word keystone, um, the impact that these creatures have on the environment is deemed as being so massive that removing them from said environment can have catastrophic results. Um, just like with a keystone in a bridge, for example, where if it's removed, the entire bridge collapses. So what you what you mean by keystone species is it has a big impact on the area that it lives in. Yeah, that's a, a simple way of putting it. And ants are known as being one of the most important of all keystone species due to the sheer number of other creatures that live in their environment come to rely on them. Um, the greatest example of that being the humble army ant. Some examples of which can have upwards of several hundred other creatures be directly or indirectly reliant on their existence in that environment, which for anyone wondering is the most of any creature to exist on Earth that we are aware of. That's a pretty big deal and that's why ants are quite important and insects as a whole are just important as much as I really don't like creepy crawlies and things of that nature, even though I do find them quite cool. The worst is the daddy long legs. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they're not a keystone species. They might be. Surely you can get rid of them. You don't know. <laughs> they're horrible. Like people often say about wasps, don't they? Like, what is the purpose of a wasp? Oh, they, they're just flying, bumbling assholes. <laughs> just, they're just angry bees. They're just bees that are dicks. <laughs> That's all it is. It's like bumblebees. Like, you think of a bumble, it's, oh, hello. It's all one, just like bumbling around. <laughs> That's where the like, name Dumbledore comes from. <laughs> So the image of just like a doddery old man, like, ooh, 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 ooh. and then I imagine he was called like Wasp. <laughs> Professor Wasp. But yeah, insects do interest me a lot, even though I don't particularly like being near them all that much. Just because some of them are so interesting and cool. Yeah. Like, I absolutely fucking love the rhinoceros beetle. Oh, yeah. One, <laughs> because it looks super awesome. And two, because have you ever seen how rhinoceros beetles get like get laid. Because there's this amazing episode of Planet Earth, I think, where they're talking about forests and they single in on a tree and go, this is where rhino beetles get their fuck on. And how it works is a female rhinoceros beetle will stand at the very top of the tree and a prospective mate will climb up it and fight off um, a rival on each branch. And it's just like, it's pitched as like this epic battle where the rhino beetle crawls up grabs a rival and throws him off. Oh my God. And then keeps crawling up and fights the next rival. It's like going through like the arcade mode of Tekken 7 for insects. And um, oh the reason it's super awesome is because after the rhino beetle gets to the top, like bests all of the challengers and mates with the female, it then flips the female off the edge. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets to the top, like, gets its prize of the female, mates with her, and just like suplexes her off the edge and flies off like a dickhead. No fucks given for the rhinoceros beetle. And in that vein, Nisha, do you have a, an insect that you think is cool, even if you wouldn't particularly like to be near it? I always thought dragonflies yeah. were pretty awesome looking, but the, I've seen one like up close because in the shop that I worked in, mm -hmm. somehow one got in <laughs> and landed on landed on like a pair of socks that were hanging up, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Oh my god!" Because they're they're huge. They're massive, yeah. None of us was like brave enough to like catch it because that's the thing with insects is they're unpredictable. They can just fly at your face yeah. when you least expect they know. it. So we were just stood watching this dragonfly on these socks for about an hour. Yeah, they're, they're beautiful creatures until you see them like fly towards your face. And um, that just reminds me a lot of flies where no matter where you are in the UK, if you leave a window open, like even the tiniest crack, a fly is coming in. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how high up you are. Cause I think I'm 10 stories up in my flat at the moment. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna open my window, it's a nice day. 30 seconds later, a big bumbling raisin comes in. It's fucking pterodactyl looking motherfucker. <laughs> And I'm like, oh God, that's the rest of my day now. Because you can't get it out. Once it's in, you're never getting it out. So if we, if we go back to talking about the army ants. Yes. What is it that they do that like 
helps to like protect other species and have an impact on their natural habitat? Uh, well, mostly it's just they serve as a source of food, which is probably the most obvious thing because there's almost an inexhaustible supply of them. And there are many creatures on Earth that subsist almost entirely on a diet of ants. But even creatures that don't specifically eat the ants still rely on them for their food because the army ants, as they travel throughout the forest, will unearth many other creepy crawlies, which other animals will then eat. And it's not that birds in particular, due to their greater than average intelligence for an animal, um, have started to cotton onto this. And there are some species of birds that will spend pretty much their entire life just following a colony of army ants, because they know if they follow the colony, there's going to be an almost inexhaustible supply of food as the ants travel throughout the forest, because they will just keep unearthing more creatures than to eat. And it's noted that some species of bird will come to rely on this source of food so much, they will protect the ants from other predators. So not only are army ants like already super tough and difficult to deal with, they have bird bodyguards. And no one fucks with birds. They pet your eyes out, man. Like, is there anything, like the, the film The Birds is probably one of the scariest films ever when you realize how it was filmed. And what, what I mean by that is they just threw birds at Tippy Hedron. <laughs> And there's a famous story behind the scenes of um, Alfred Hitchcock spent a couple of days reassuring Tippi Hedren there will be no real birds. All the real birds are going to be far away from you. We're only going to use fake birds to get your reactions. And he spent ages and ages reassuring her, look, there will be no birds near you. We just need you to film this scene and we're going to throw some fake birds at you. We just need you to scream. So, OK, I can do that. And what mm -hmm. Hitchcock did is the moment they start rolling the camera, just threw real birds at her. <laughs> so her reaction of like, ah, is genuine because they're terrifying. real birds that she's scared of. But yeah, thinking about birds as well, they have predators also. Yeah, they have predators and they have their own impact on the environment. And if their impact on the environment is directly related to the location and welfare of the ants, uh, the ants are indirectly responsible for everything the birds do too. And it's noted that not only will the birds become fodder for other predators, but there are creatures that will subsist almost entirely on the shit they leave behind. And that's not me being crude or crass, because there exists somewhere in the world a species of butterfly that subsists almost entirely on bird shit left behind <laughs> from birds that are following ant colonies, becoming a what? second link in a chain of shitty in insects. Okay, I see butterflies as these like nice, elegant insects, but now I know they eat shit. Some species of them eat shit. There's also that species of butterfly that eats tears. Have you ever seen those? No. What yeah, the there's a species of butterflies that just um, eat tears. But yeah, I was just wondering, are these army ants quite dangerous? Yes, they are. And in some areas of the world, they're noted as being quite destructive and in some cases pests. But it's noted that army ants, for the most part, will only attack things that directly attack them and in some cases will actively ignore creatures that pose no threat to them or aren't competing with them for food, in effect becoming pseudo-protectors of those creatures. Then there are multiple examples of that in the animal kingdom, like you've probably seen those birds that pick things out of crocodiles' teeth. And that's a symbiotic relationship where the crocodile gets its teeth cleaned and the bird get something to eat. But also a side effect of this relationship is now that the bird is pretty much safe because no one's going to attack it when it's sat on the back of a crocodile. And I love crocodile stuff like that. Crocodile bodyguard. Those, yeah, you've got a crocodile <laughs> bodyguard or you've got those um, fish that attach themselves to sharks and eat the parasites off of sharks. And it's the same deal where it's the sharks will just ignore the fish, they get cleaned and then the fish get just the protection of being near a shark because there's not many creatures that are going to try and attack them when they're attached to the side of a giant great white. And yeah, I love that in nature, that just sometimes nature works together even if it doesn't really mean to, it just does it by accident. And it really does help the army ant live up to its name when not only have they got the numbers of their entire colony, but then they've got like an army of birds, butterflies and whatever the fuck else relies on them. <laughs> yeah, don't fuck with army ants. So I'm not sure if it'll have gotten cut, but we briefly discussed earlier um, being attacked by bats, which reminded me of potentially one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. And it was recounted to me by a friend who I'll call Adam because that's his name, who currently resides in China. So there's no fucking way he's gonna hear this one from behind that great firewall. And it was a time when he went on a school trip to a zoo. And on the way to the zoo, as a joke, they put a bunch of raisins in a guy's hood because that's the kind of thing you do when you're a dickhead teenager and they probably forgot all about it as they were walking around the park. And they got to the fruit bat. 
cave. Anisha, have you ever been <gasps> in a fruit bat cave? No. Uh, in a zoo? Oh, no. Okay, well, the way no. they work is, um, it's like you go in and you just walk around and the bats are there. But because of the echolocation, the bats won't hit you. But apparently this guy was terrified. Terrified. He was scared of bats. Oh, and God. the zookeeper or the person in charge of the bat cave told him, look, I, they might seem scary, they might fly near you, but they're as scared of you as you are of them. They will not touch you. I guarantee you that the bats will not come near you. And it apparently took a solid five minutes of coaxing before this guy would walk into the cave with everyone else cheering him on. It's like, don't worry, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. At which point they realised, oh no, the, the, the raisin's in his hood. Oh, and according no. to my friend Adam, he walks in within a second of getting in there every bat in the cave flew directly at him but these <gasps> caves are almost in pitch blackness oh. so no one knew what was going on except for him and oh all he could feel was dozens and dozens of bats flying at his face and trying to get into his clothes and as you might be tempted to do in a situation like that he pulls his hood over his head <laughs> at which point the raisins fly everywhere and the bats go ape shit. and the reason this story will stick in my head forever is because at that moment that guy starts going oh they're shitting on me they're shitting on me <laughs> It's just these raisins fly away and these bats are swirling around. Like <laughs> in the dark night. And just, oh just something God. about the straight five minutes of, look, don't worry, <laughs> nothing bad's going to happen. Literally two seconds after he walks in, every bat in the cave attacks him at once. <laughs> He's in complete pitch black so he can't see them. He just oh feels dozens and dozens of bats flying at him. <laughs> And obviously he's not allowed to run out because he might have a bat on him. <laughs> God, so like, I can't go anywhere. what do you think? You know, he can't run out. So all the handlers grab him to stop him running out because they don't want him to have his clothes full of bats and release all the bats. <laughs> so oh he's just God. being tackled by security and bats are everywhere and there's raisins <laughs> that he thinks he's poo and he's always raining down. <laughs> it's just, what a rough day for that guy. But what an amazing story. <laughs>